Welcome to the Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Hosted by John Joseph Adams and David Barr Kirtley. Hi, this is Dave. And this is John. And welcome to episode 15 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, today we'll be interviewing Dan Carlin. He's the host of the popular Hardcore History podcast. Uh, it's it's a, just one of my favorite podcasts. Uh, he talks about history and he kind of takes a science fiction approach to, to things. Uh, I can read a couple of descriptions of some of the episodes that'll give you a, a sense of this. So uh, episode 13, what would happen if half the population died in a short period of time? Dan looks at the Black Death and other plagues that created almost apocalyptic conditions in the past and maybe in the future. Episode 9. What was the cause of the collapse of the Bronze Age? War? Famine? Natural disaster? Sauron, the Dark Lord? <laughs> Dan looks at all the potential villains, except for Sauron. And episode 6. Spartans, Athenians, Persians, and references to Star Trek all make appearances in this look at the, at the dramatic and extremely consequential Greek and Persian wars. Yeah, I wish my history classes were like that. I mean, you know, <laughs> if you could sprinkle in a Star Trek reference or two, that would have made it a lot more lively, I think. What, what really drove home to me how good this podcast is, is he, he did a recent episode, or he did a, a three-part episode on the Punic Wars uh, that I just, I absolutely, I cannot recommend this uh, highly enough. Uh, I mean, I just, I just had chills listening to this. My heart was racing. Uh, this, it starts <laughs> with uh, show 23, Punic Nightmares 1. So everyone, I mean, definitely go check that out. And, but I had, uh, about a year, a year ago, I had bought uh, an audio book about Hannibal, and I, I was just really disappointed with it. You know, I, I started reading it. And first of all, it turned out it had nothing to do with the A-team whatsoever. <laughs> I was going to say, like, you know, you thought it was going to be about, you know, Clary Starling and her further adventures <laughs> with uh, Hannibal Lecter. And you were like, ah, oh, man, it says uh, Hannibal right on the cover. What the hell? But but this book, it was, I mean, I, and I feel like this is the problem with so many history books and things, is that I felt like the author just felt like he had to include every single fact about Hannibal that he had ever learned in all his years of research. And, and most of them were just not interesting or relevant. And Wait, just... are, you, are you not supposed to do that? <laughs> and it was just boring. And, uh, you know, I just I gave up on it after an hour and a half. It's, it's actually kind of like this, the, the same problem that a lot of science fiction authors have. It's like, you know, I did all this research. Now you have to suffer for it. <laughs> yeah. But then after listening to the hardcore history treatment of this same story i just i'm like how could anyone make this story boring it's <laughs> it's such an amazing story and you know if you just tell it like a story it's it's just so fascinating and just to give you a sort of a sample of of what it's like uh he uh, he related this story about the death of archimedes that i thought was kind of relevant for this show because this this death is famous as one of the great geek deaths <laughs> in all of history um so you know uh, a lot of the italian city-states were not happy to be part of the roman empire and so one of these Italian city-states was Syracuse. And so when Hannibal invaded, they saw their chance, and they allied with Hannibal, hoping to break away from Rome. And so then the Romans came in and, and besieged the city. But the Roman commander told his men not to kill Archimedes, who was in the city, and who was famous for his ability to invent incredible siege machinery, which is why the Romans wanted him. And so the Roman soldiers are just going around through the city, killing people and stuff. And so a, a Roman soldier busts into the room where Archimedes is and says, and Archimedes is drawing in the dirt. He's sort of solving equations uh, on the floor in the dirt. And the Roman soldier says, what's your name? And Archimedes says, go away, I'm busy. And the Roman soldier killed him. <laughs> not knowing, kind of just angry, not knowing it was, you know, not knowing it was Archimedes. So he was just so, so intent on his math that he didn't, you know, didn't want to be bothered by a little, little thing like soldiers busting into his room. So here, you know, Archimedes, we at Geek's Guide to the Galaxy salute you. <laughs> and so uh, so I'm really looking forward to talking with Dan. And then uh, stick around after the interview when John and I will be talking about history and movies and things like that. All right, let's get Dan Carlin on the phone. This is Dan. Uh, hi, it's Dave and John from Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Glad to, ha glad to be on. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, so you, uh, so first of all, um, you often mention on your show that you're a big science fiction fan. Uh, who are some of your favorite science fiction authors? Oh my goodness, I haven't had a lot of time. I tell people these days that I, I just have not had a lot of time to get into uh, light and fun reading for a long time. I'm an old Lord of the Rings fan, which of course isn't science fiction. Um, back in the old days of the original Star Trek, I thought some of those writers were fantastic. People like DC Fontana, and uh, oh my goodness, a number of great writers for that series. 
As far as the science fiction books, I mean, just the classics, the Isaac Asimovs um, and H.G. Wells. I mean, I go back to that kind of stuff. Uh, do you think there's any connection between your interest in science fiction and your interest in history? Uh, I see them as kind of related. I mean, how many of the great science fiction storylines somehow have people either going back into the past or going into the future, this idea of running into strange and unusual things for the first time, that's got a historical element. I mean, I see the two so intertwined. I mean, heck, science fiction is talking about the future, so you're already into that time continuum question you know, that history deals with anyway. I mean, what would you call um, history of the future? I was just thinking of an Isaac Asimov line. I think he said that when he thinks about writing about science fiction, he thinks about writing the history of the future. So uh, how did you get interested in history, and what are some of the best historical resources that you've come across? Uh, I was born interested in it. I, I, there's no good uh, way to explain. I, as a matter of fact, uh, my mom is in town visiting my kids right now. We got into the subject of how much of who you are is hardwired and how much of it is learned and acquired. And I, I had talked about how much I see in my kids the hardwiring, you know, that you're not aware is there until you actually watch it in motion. And she said, well, you were hardwired for this whole history thing. You know, you were into it from such an early age, and it didn't seem to rub off on you from any other sources. So, I mean, I almost think some people are born interested in certain topics. And I think if that's true, I was born interested in history. And as far as uh, resources that I liked, well, depends. I mean, how specific do you want to get? There are great historical resources for particular eras and topics and subjects. Um, if you want... Who I like, though, in a grand scheme of things, there's a great set of books that I'm sure most people run into at the bookstores called The History of Civilization by Will and Ariel Durant. And it's kind of old-style history compared to the modern way it's done today. But there's something wonderfully classic about it. And so when I talk about resources that it's good for any library to have, um, that History of Civilization set of books is wonderful. So uh, why did you decide to launch a history podcast, and uh, what's your basic philosophy when it comes to teaching history? Well, it was not my idea. It was my mother-in-law's idea, which I constantly give her grief over when I'm running behind deadline. Um, she just asked why I didn't do a podcast about the kinds of stuff we talk about at the dinner table, because I would tell all these twisted stories um, at dinner, and I'm not so sure they went over so well at dinner <laughs> uh, and she would say well why don't you do a show about these things and I said well who would be interested in that and um, and for some reason we tried it and people were interested in it and I was still surprised by that um, but we were doing another podcast that we do on, on current events and such and so we just added it to the repertoire and um, you know off we went I guess it's, it's proven to be surprising to us Could you give an example of one of a twisted story that you might tell at the dinner table? I think I might have brought up ritual child sacrifice or something like that <laughs> one night during, you know, the cutting of the steak or something. <laughs> and it must have been absurdly badly timed. Or you'll bring up the bubonic plague and how many people it killed during dessert. And sometimes those things just maybe wrong time, wrong place, maybe. Uh, and how about your philosophy when it comes to teaching history? Well, first of all, I'm not a history teacher, so I don't have a philosophy on teaching history. Um, my, my dad um, used to be in films, and he would write that he had a prescription for a money-making film, and it was entertainment value every three pages, and he meant three pages of the script, that there should be something, a car chase, some romance, something every three pages to keep the listener interested. And I find that that's pretty much an old storyteller's rule, and the way that they teach history, as I'm sure you guys know, in a lot of traditional societies is the way in medieval times they used to do it with a troubadour. They'll have somebody who's a storyteller go from town to town and usually bring some paintings with him to, to illustrate, you know, in an ancient version of like a PowerPoint presentation, um, the past of the people he's talking to. And the stories are wonderful. And they talk about the great deeds and the drama and the highs and the lows and the romances and all the parts of the story that would make a great movie, which are all a part of history. And my philosophy has always been to try to emulate as much as possible the oral storytellers, which people have naturally gravitated towards when they wanted to hear a good history story. So, so speaking of fascinating things, uh, a popular fantasy monster is the centaur, half human and half horse. Uh, how did that legend originate? 
thoughts? Well, um, there are thoughts among some that it referred to the peoples of the steppe, the uh, nomadic horse riders so well known for their archery, uh, people that you'll know through history from the Mongols to the Turks to the Huns to the Sarmatians to the Alans to the Scythians, all these ancient peoples. Um, the Greeks knew of the Scythians and they saw them riding and they may have thought, some historians believe, that the person was so wedded to the animal it was as though they were one. I saw a National Geographic special once where they were showing female riders uh, at target practice in Mongolia and the way that they do this is they ride at full gallop they lean down behind the horse so that they fire from under the neck so that if you were in a wartime situation, you would literally be exposing almost none of your body to the side the enemy could shoot at you from. And then they would shoot at these targets from about 30 or 40 yards away, and they would hit it every time. And I just remember thinking while I was watching that that these are not warriors. These are hobbyists in Mongolia now, hmm. and they were amazing. How much better must the people who literally did this in military life and death situations have been? And that's when you can see a centaur sort of um, legend arising, because these women looked like centaurs already. Uh, so in your most recent episode on European colonization, you invited listeners to imagine how things might look from the perspective of a hypothetical future in which human populations are far more blended than they are now. Uh, could you talk a bit about this thought experiment and why you chose to use it as a tool for examining the past? Uh, a lot of people weren't happy with the way we looked at that uh, story. They didn't like the racial angle. And we knew when we chose it that it was going to be controversial. But we kind of made the call in the end that that was what sort of made it available for us to even talk about. You're not going to hear that on the History Channel because they're not going to want to deal with the emails we've been getting ever since we did it. Um, and the way we looked at it is we thought, you know, if someday people are all more of one color. I've heard some anthropologists suggest that eventually, through the intermingling, all the different peoples of the world will be a more similar color. Isn't our past, and aren't the differences in human beings that we take for granted now, based on things like skin color, isn't that going to look really weird to people when there is no difference in skin color? And one of the things that might look different, we suggested, was this whole question of the age of exploration. When you know, that 300 year period when Europe came to dominate the world. And it must look really funny down the road that a bunch of these, you know, I always compared as we were all a bunch of guinea pigs in a cage. And all of a sudden, the little teeny white guinea pigs that were outnumbered by everyone else started picking on all the other ones. Wouldn't you think something was different about the white guinea pigs? And that's kind of how the whole history of the era has been looked at over time. And so we kind of touched the edge of that, you know, third rail of history and got burned a little bit, but I think if people can think outside the box in a science fiction kind of sense, I think it's an interesting question. What have been some of the more controversial uh, episodes that you've done? Well, I think that one's probably the most controversial right there. I think, uh, um, see, a normal kind of controversy we'll get will be like something when we talked about the Punic Wars and we talked about the old rumor that the Carthaginians practiced child sacrifice in some of their religious rituals. So I'll still get email from people that consider the ancient Phoenicians and Carthaginians to be their distant ancestors, and they will write upset that I perpetuated this long-running piece of what they call propaganda about their ancestors. Or you'll get something perhaps from a Native American who wasn't too happy with, although to be honest, most of the Native Americans really like the Apache Tears episode. But when you talk about these subjects from either recent history or that still have groups that are upset or hurt, and sometimes justifiably so, by the events of the past. Sometimes some of that will uh, lash out at us a little bit. But so far, most people seem okay. Okay, so um, I'm a big fan of post-apocalyptic stories. Um, you did an episode recently on the Black Death in Europe. Uh, what, what can that experience teach us about how post-apocalyptic scenario might unfold, and what do you think of the way science fiction writers have dealt with the subject? I think that they're pretty good at that. I mean, I think I think that that's one of those areas that, that has been data mined, I guess you could say, in the science fiction realm from very early on, even before anybody had any real legitimate fears of things that I grew up with, like nuclear war and whatnot, which seemed to make it almost an Occam's razor kind of a situation where you were going to face an apocalyptic situation. Um, I think the whole disease thing is so interesting because 
we're really the first couple of human generations to not really worry about disease the way all of humans throughout all of history you know did forever the idea of mass epidemics that are going to carry away large swaths of our population doesn't really even enter our, into our thinking now when our grandparents can still vaguely remember a time when polio was justifiably feared because it would sweep through a population and leave you know, 20% of it unable to walk for the rest of their lives. So I think the fact that we've become immune from a constant human fear that troubled all of our ancestors forever makes us an interesting generation in and of itself. But I think it, it deadens us to the idea that it's still possible. And I think science fiction writers are very good at creating scenarios to remind you that just because we've become immune to the plagues that have already struck, some new one. I mean, AIDS was one of those plagues that we were told was going to be like biblical in nature. But the difference was is because it didn't come into your population and wipe everybody out in five days, it didn't have that same sort of feel. If we had a new bubonic plague, it'd be, I mean, society would have no time to adjust to the number of deaths. I mean, we'd have a quarter of the population dead in, in a month or, or even three. And there's no way for a human society to adapt that quickly. Like they used to say in medieval times, you know, there weren't enough living to bury the dead. Hard to imagine that now. Do you have any uh, favorite uh, post-apocalyptic books or movies that you can think of? Post-apocalyptic? Well, I mean, there was some good Vonnegut stuff. Um, uh, Cat's Cradle, for example, was good, where he talked about Ice Nine and that creating. But it wasn't really a post-apocalyptic as much as an apocalypse <laughs> book, I guess you could say. Um, post-apocalyptic? I'm not even sure... Throw some at like me. I mean, I, Mad Max. Uh, oh, see, I, no, 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 that would not have been me. That wasn't the science fiction I went for. Um, <laughs> uh, no, mine was always, there was always, I guess post-apocalyptic would be a pessimist's uh, view of the future, whereas I was always thinking there was going to be, you know, if you were into something like Star Trek, you were looking at some wonderful future as opposed to some terrible one. I think I talk about the potential for a terrible one in my current events show enough. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you need an escape. Um, so some popular movies in recent years have dealt with historical subjects such as uh, Gladiator, 300, and Kingdom of Heaven, to name a few. Um, what do you think of these movies and, uh, and historical movies in general? I'm sorry. Can you, can you list the movies for me again? Oh, sure. Um, Gladiator, 300, and Kingdom of Heaven. I didn't like any of them. <laughs> uh, might, might be a good way to put it. Uh, and, I, and you could throw into the mix if you want uh, uh, Oliver Stone's Alexander. Didn't like that either. And I, it's funny you ask that because my mom is in town right now. She just asked me if I was going to watch that uh, Steven Spielberg thing, uh, uh, American Troops in the Pacific in the Second World War. And I said no because I tend to not like these historical dramas. And um, one of the reasons why is I get you know all persnickety over some of the historical details sometimes. Not so much in the World War II stuff, but if you take me back to 300 or Gladiator, there's only so far the writer can go before he loses me on the history stuff. It doesn't have to be perfect, but I get a little freaked out pretty quickly. And the story in 300 is such a wonderful tale. You would think, gosh, I would love to see that in the hands of a proper individual, just like I would have loved to have seen. There were rumors that while Oliver Stone was working on his version of Alexander, Martin Scorsese was planning a version of Alexander the Great too, and I thought, oh, now that's a director I would love to see his treatment of that film, because Alexander's whole existence could be compared to a mafia-style family. Hmm. And so a mafia-style director doing that story, there's a certain appeal to me that he might just get it right. Um, but in general, I find that, that, look, it would be hard for me a guy who takes the drama from history and makes a podcast out of it to say that I don't like that in movies. I just feel like the angles chosen are not often the angles I would choose or that some of the stuff is predictable. And so in movie and movies like 300, I thought turned that into a comic book. I would have liked to have seen um, that event. And I understand it was a stylized artistic piece and that was the goal of the director. I would have liked to have seen the Battle of Thermopylae and that whole Spartans versus Persians things turned into something much more along the lines of a horror flick where you just had, it was a, a nightmare on Elm Street kind of thing where the violence was ultra real as opposed to comic book-like to give you a real feel for how could these people 
you know, I mean, it's one thing to do what we do today, which is often to kill people from a distance. We required in the old days that all these people turn into individual versions of Charles Manson. Hmm. And so showing a battlefield worthy of a Charles Manson murder scene is much more disturbing to me than watching all that comic book book blood stuff fly around. Yeah, um, I, I'd be curious to know if you have any examples that uh, you think – uh, sort of get it very accurate. Um, I mean, one movie that comes to mind for me is uh, Braveheart. I mean, I don't know how accurate that it really is, but um, what struck me was the battle sequences were like so horrifying to me to watch, like just the, you know, people's getting their legs chopped off and stuff. And it's just like so barbaric to like look at back at it now. But I mean, I, I don't know uh, if that was particularly accurate or not. I, I would make the case to you that that none of it comes close to the reality. I remember everyone was making a big deal about saving Private Ryan when it first came out and how the first part where the uh, soldiers are landing on the beach in Normandy is so realistic, you know, filled in the, filmed in the speedy, fast camera to give you a feel of panic and the whole thing. And yet while I was watching it, I kept thinking, okay, where's the artillery? I mean, you're not seeing... They, they toned it down as bad as everybody thought it was. Um, a wonderful example, uh, uh, you bring up Braveheart. I'm reading a, rereading a book right now called Blood Red Roses, which is about the excavations after a battle from the English uh, Civil War in medieval times called the War of the Roses. And they've taken these skeletons out of the grave and they're applying modern forensic techniques to them using MRIs and X-rays and all that stuff. And you cannot believe the wicked damage that these weapons were doing to these people. And you turn around and you go, you couldn't show this in a movie. I mean, you literally, I mean, you would, all of us would just turn away, you know, if you could watch for a couple of seconds, it would be traumatic. So I would get the feeling that as bad as you thought it was, it didn't touch the reality of the situation. So, so there are no movies that you think really mm -hmm. are historically accurate? I would say that there are scenes that are. I mean, we, mm. we've all seen um, an occasional scene, especially when you see it on a one-to-one on -one level. You know, one soldier's in a trench with another soldier, you know, and there's some death scene going on. I think that stuff can get realistically uh, portrayed at times. Uh, I think the more you try to show and the wider the camera pans out, the more unrealistic it starts to become. And I think once you start talking about, like, uh, I love to go to these movies uh, to watch them try to show large masses of troops on the battlefield to try to get good impressions of what that must look like. And I feel like no matter what, we just get some stylized movie version, no matter how close to the truth they try to get. If for no other reason, then there's no one alive who even saw what that looked like. So we wouldn't even know if we had it right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, what does, an ancient, what does an ancient battle look like, and who can tell us? Mm -hmm. You know, who's going to be the technical advisor to make sure we get that scene right? You know, there's no one who's lived to see it. And soon there's going to be no one that lived to see, um, you know, real First World Army fighting First World Army combat of the sort you saw in the Second World War. I mean, these things die. This kind of firsthand historical knowledge dies out after a while. Well, so, so you mentioned uh, that you liked Lord of the Rings. Um, do you... Do you generally like those, the kind of um, imaginary history in fantasy novels like that, or do you have some of the same sorts of um, problems with the historical inaccuracy? I think the way Lord of the Rings got around that, um, you know, because obviously if you're dealing with a book that's fantasy or science fiction oriented, you can't be a stick, stickler for historical reality. I mean, you just, that's the first thing that has to go out the window for believability to happen. So what works so well, though, with Tolkien was that he had based so much of the way he approached the subject matter from the point of view to, it's funny because this brings the conversation around full circle, to the oral historians we talked about earlier. In his case, the oral historians from places like Finland and the Scandinavian countries and some of the old English or Anglo-Saxon stuff. You would go back to the to the Norse sagas, and he, he, he was a professor of the Anglo-Saxon language and some of the, the myths and the various storytelling styles of the way they told their history. And so when you incorporate that as part of your template, you can hear a, a, what is clearly a fantasy story like Lord of the Rings and immerse yourself in it as though you were hearing history. I mean, how much of the Lord of the Rings is literally filling you in on the past of this imaginary world? He's essentially doing what Isaac Asimov said he did for sci-fi, where he said, I write the history of the future, 
J.R.R. Tolkien was writing the history of a place that never was, and yet he fills you in on it enough so that you care about the present, and the present struggles in the book only make sense because you're aware of their place in history of a world that never even existed. That's what makes it such a piece of genius, I think. Although it was it was funny in Fellowship of the Ring, there's a line about them eating tomatoes, and a lot of people really fixated on that and said, you know, how could they eat tomatoes? That's a new world plant, and... Uh, you know, this movie full of Balrogs and <laughs> wizards and, and stuff. It's like the tomatoes is what really people get get worked up about. Like, how could that happen? I think once you start a fantasy topic, anything becomes possible. And it's very hard to nitpick anything, you know. That, I mean, and you're right. Once, once those things start happening, rules begin to be developed. And then people start applying, you know, real rules to this makeup world. It's kind of funny how maybe we human beings have a need for even our makeup fantasy world to make sense. Uh, so, uh, speaking of science fiction and fantasy, uh, a few a few such authors who use a lot of history in their work are people like Harry Turtle Dove, Connie Willis, or Tim Powers. Um, are you familiar with any of those authors? Or I actually have read um, some Harry Turtle Dove. One of my producers back in my radio days uh, uh, lent me one of his books, and I, I love the concept so much. I mean, I, I to play with the idea. I even have dreams of you know time machines and going back in time. You know, with Bic lighters or other mm-hmm. uh, little... It's its a little like, I don't know if you guys ever remember, a, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Mm-hmm. It was the whole idea that somebody gets in a time machine and, you know, you know how to cure the king's headache and you, you know how to, you know, create a... Or wasn't there even when you go back to some of the Star Treks and they go back in time and they're creating radios and all these kinds of things. Oh, those are wonderful fantasies. And I think Harry Turtledove in one of his books... Isn't it like the in the future the aliens deliver AK-47s to Confederate soldiers hmm. in the Civil War? I mean, those are those are wonderful things to play with initially. I think it's very hard to keep a story like that from riding off the rails at some point. But when you start off with such a great premise, I mean, I try to do that sometimes in the hardcore history shows if I can think of them. Um, so, like you were talking about examples where like time time travels involved, but um, uh, what do you think of uh, like sort of straight alternate history stories where you know there's no science fiction or fantasy element involved? It's just uh, the author is telling a story in which certain key events in history transpired differently, thus re- uh, resulting in a completely different uh, future that followed uh, from those events. No, I love all that stuff. That's And that, that all falls in the category. I remember when I was a kid, they used to have comic books all about that, where there would just be alternative history comic books. And I thought that stuff was just as fascinating. Um, and all of, you know, we used to call it what-if history. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and Neil Ferguson, who's a historian at Harvard, among other places, he gave it a wonderful-sounding academic name. So now we can claim it's, like, you know, studious to mm-hmm. study the what-if stuff. He calls it counterfactual history. Mm-hmm. And it's wonderful because you can turn around and examine an event in a way that it never occurred and actually glean some insight into the event the way it did occur. I mean, it it begins to three-dimensionalize it once you explore the other roads that could have been taken, if that makes sense. Uh, So I've heard some historians say that they wouldn't want to actually meet humans of past centuries because they would find them pretty unpleasant. Uh, What do you think about that? And do you feel that the human race as a whole is gradually becoming more decent? I uh, I disagree in terms of wanting to meet people because I, I not only want to meet them, I want to see... I mean, I would love to see a photograph. I'd love to see a photograph of a medieval person or an ancient person. Um, I'd love to have a look at them and just... I mean, I feel like there's so many things we don't know that 30 seconds after actually seeing one of these people, you'd be able to confirm or dispel so many you know historical realities or fables. Um uh, not only would I, l- I'd love to sit down and talk with them, I'd love to pick their brain. You're getting into now a little bit of like personal belief here because this isn't really based on history. But I have my own view that there's, and, and a lot of historians do too. I mean, this is the old way to look at history, but that civilization waxed and waned. You know, you had ages of high civilization and then ages of lower civilization. You would go through cycles. Um, I think if you met a cultured urbane Egyptian person from the New Kingdom Egyptian dynasties, you know, in the 2400 BCs, they would seem um, to be just as cultured and easy to be around from a manners and, and perspective, you know, from uh, as a Roman, a high Roman of the upper class would be. Um, you get my point, is that I, I think 
there are other areas of history where we lived a much more rustic and raw and close to the ground and mean, not mean as in nasty, but mean as in poor existence where we would appear barbaric to each other. It just depends on the where's and the when's. I think you could get all the rich cultured people throughout history though in a room and they might not be as different from each other as we think. I mean, you did do this episode, though, about how parenting practices maybe have improved and might produce more civilized people going forward. Well, that's a view, and we quoted somebody else. That was somebody else's view, that, that uh, I, and I would call those the optimists in history. One of the benchmarks that a lot of people, and, and I'm included in this, I'm in this camp, uh, have with history that makes history relevant is that people don't change. You know, human nature is static. Therefore, any lessons we get from the past are applicable because even though that guy in Roman times didn't have computers and he dressed differently and all those things, he was still a human being who made human decisions based on human limitations. But there are some who think that the human species is improvable, I guess you could say, and that you could actually create better people over time. And some of these people are the people we quoted in that one show on children where they believe that because we're becoming better at raising human beings and understanding you know, how to make a, a more well-adjusted person you know, by good parenting, that you might actually be able to improve the basic components you're dealing with, build a better human being. Um, and, and that's their view. And if that's true, then you're talking about actually being able to create a different being than you see when you go back and you study, say, Greek and Roman history or ancient Chinese history or, or read about the peoples of the early New World. I mean, what do you think maybe about the potential of genetically engineering people to be morally superior or something like that? I think physically superior, I don't think there's any question. I mean, I think that stuff can happen. And I think, uh, I think that stuff will happen. I mean, I am kind of a historical pessimist, and I think it when people discover knowledge, it's really hard to imagine them not doing something with it. And um, I imagine you'll get, I mean, listen, the Nazis were way ahead of their times in a lot of this stuff. They talked about doing all this kind of stuff and you recoil in horror at it. And then when people talk about it in terms of possible scientific advancements, all of a sudden it starts sounding better. And I always think back and go, no, this stuff still sounds weird. And and you know, brave new world Naziistic kind of stuff to me. I'm not, uh, I'm not a fan, but I just, I, I can't imagine developing nuclear weapons and not using them. I can't imagine developing, you know, germ weapons and not using them. I just get the feeling that somewhere down the road, somebody's going to try to improve the human species, and I think you're likely to have gross, you know, unimaginable side effects. That, uh, well, you know, that even open the door to such weird things as that apocalyptic scenario we talked about earlier with disease. I mean, you might be able to create a perfect human being that has some vulnerability to some disease the rest of us are already immune to and open the door to all kinds of problems. So I'm not for tinkering, but I'm pessimistic that we'll do so anyway. Overall, what's the response to the podcast? Well, I mean, I'm not the audience. I can only tell you what we, what we hear. We tried to do something different. Uh, with the show, and we, we, we deliberately felt like there's a, a niche here that's not being uh, dealt with to be able to almost take a Rod Serling approach to history and examine it differently. And since I'm not a history teacher, I have no academic credibility to worry about. Uh, I can destroy it at, at my leisure. Um, we can have some fun with this, is the way I thought. And especially because and, you know, it's just serendipity that it worked out this way. But, but I think real history is deteriorating in the mainstream media. I mean, if you turn on the History Channel now, I don't think they're even trying to do history. And I don't think they're even worried about us knowing that they're not trying hmm. to do history. And so that opens the door, I think, more to trying to take, uh, uh, find that audience that finds the subject fascinating. And talk about, and it, simply my whole approach is to talk about it the way I read about it. I mean, this is what interests me. And if it interests me, I pass it along to the audience, and so far we've managed to attract a group of people as twisted as twisted about it as I am, um, and who can appreciate the weird things that we bring out there the way I do. I still manage to make them angry from time to time, but um, the good news is, is that you know they, they still listen to the program, and we still seem to be doing pretty well, and and we're grateful in these hard times to have a gig, you know. <laughs> so uh, what uh, what lies ahead for hardcore history? Uh? What, what, what kind of subjects are you thinking about, and do you have any format changes or anything that you might want to experiment with? 
Well, as you guys probably know, one of the things about developing a, a show, and we have a saying around here that Seinfeld wasn't Seinfeld, you know, until 10 or 12 episodes into it. And what we mean by that is that any kind of episodic content evolves in its own direction after you create it and doesn't turn into its final form for a while. Um, Seinfeld wasn't Seinfeld for 10 episodes. Your show probably wasn't if you listened to the first two or three shows, what it is now. Our show Our, probably still isn't our show. <laughs> well, it doesn't. And there's some truth to that. And Hardcore History might not be either. Um, but when we, de- when, we, when we designed it, it was one show. It grew into another. And the show that it became does not allow me to do certain things that I still am interested in. Um, one of which was... Well, I'm not even going to tell you. See, I can't tell him, Ben. Ben's in the room, if you believe in Ben. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I can't tell anybody what because they'll do it. But there are, there are things that I've been planning to do for a long time that do not lend themselves to the sort of deep analysis and fun we try to have with the history show. And my plan is, if I can get Ben to do enough work to uh, focus more on the content side of things and produce more stuff. I mean, that's, that's the, as you guys know, the hard part about podcasting is producing the podcast, getting them out there. We want to do more of that. Uh, well, we're definitely looking forward to anything that you uh, you produce. I appreciate that. You guys are nice to have me on the program. And that was our interview. So thanks so much to Dan Carlin for joining us on the show. Yeah, when you were talking about Archimedes there, the, that just made me think of uh, there was an episode of the Mythbusters where um, they tested something called uh, the Archimedes Death Ray, uh, which was uh, this. these blueprints were found, I guess, of, of a device that Archimedes had created but uh, i mean nobody knows i guess if he ever actually used it but it, it employed all these different mirrors and uh it, it sort of just it, it focused the power of the sun in a way that made the reflection of, of the light sort of turn into his kind of death ray and uh so i was surprised to see that mythbusters were actually able to sort of replicate it to the point where they could set a ship on fire at a distance uh with this death ray Al- although it didn't actually work too great it's like the ships would have to get pretty close and it took quite a while for the ship to catch on fire so um it's like like in, like the ship was like sort of anchored offshore and was just waiting there <laughs> like maybe you know and not not that far offshore but anchored definitely it would have to be anchored and sit, sit in the same place for a long time um if, if that happened then they, they could have used the the death ray but otherwise it, it wasn't all that great maybe that's why um it's not uh among archimedes's most uh famous inventions so it wasn't so much a death ray as like a mild sunburn ray. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Although I probably wouldn't have felt too good if, if they had focused it on you. I mean, it probably would have given you a nasty burn. Mm. Uh, I mean, it, it's funny how, you know, there are just inventions like that that are possible, but no one would ever really use them. I remember, I don't remember what story it was, but I know there was a Gene Wolfe story where he had written about people inventing hot air balloons hundreds of years before you know they were actually used because there you know there's no reason people couldn't have made a hot air balloon you know all you need is fire and silk and and stuff and it's just nobody all the stuff was there it's just nobody thought to put one together you know i mean i think that's uh, i mean that's certainly part of the appeal of steampunk is that you know you sort of have these concepts and ideas that maybe weren't around at the time um when steampunk would happen but you know at like the old west sort of period like you know the the technology had never been invented but it, it could have been or you know if you sort of take some liberties with the laws of physics and say that steam power can do anything you know you could have made these other things and, it, and it's interesting to see how that changes um societies that you know sort of have this different technology at, when they're at that otherwise uh, more primitive level and i mean i think that's sort of a lot of the same appeal what dan was talking about with with the connecticut yankee in king arthur's court you know where just any sort of normal person from the 21st century or i guess in mark twain's day it would have been though at the 19th century um going back to king arthur's time you know just having the knowledge of being in the modern age and going back like you would know how to do so much stuff although i think a lot of us 21st century people wouldn't actually know as much uh, as you as you might think like I, I mean, like he mentioned something about like you know knowing how to cure the king's headache or something, right? And and, and it's like uh, I don't know that I would. I mean, I, I couldn't tell you how to make aspirin or anything. You know, it's like okay, well, yeah, you can cure his headache by taking some aspirin. But like, well, I actually think I don't know how to make it. I think about that sometimes. I mean, you know, just I think if you're like a science fiction writer, you just just in your spare time, you you think about scenarios like, oh man, what if I ended up back <laughs> in the past and and I had to explain to people, they're like, okay, you're from the future. What kind of weapons we need to build some great weapon that'll save the world you know and you're like well you could build like an atom bomb right and they're like great how do we do that and you're like um pff, yeah let's see you need some plutonium right and uh <laughs> and they're like okay okay what's that <laughs> how do we get that there was like i guess there was this movie called morons from outer space and you know the uh 
the government captures these aliens and they want to know how their uh, UFO, you know, what makes it work and stuff. And the guys are like, well, you push down on the gas pedal and it goes, you know, and it's like, that's, just, you know, I mean, how many, yeah, like how many modern people could explain how, how does a transistor work? Or like, how does your car work? How does your laptop work? Or how does a CD-ROM work or anything, you know, if you had right. to explain it to someone so that they could invent it? Yeah, no, I mean, I don't know about you or, or, or most other people, but I mean, I certainly, I would not be that useful. I mean, my, all the knowledge I have, like, you know, it would not actually transfer all that well to seeming all that amazing, probably. I mean, you know, we would have some sort of general idea of like what the future would hold, like just based on what we know of history. But even that, I mean, my, you know, I'm, I'm certainly no history expert. I, I, I certainly couldn't tell you um any like sort of key dates like if i if i was back in the old west or whatever in like tombstone like i couldn't tell you like when the okay corral thing was going to happen or whatever you know i mean i I wouldn't actually be all that useful i don't think or like if you were to go back in time and meet william wallace because john during our interview mentioned braveheart in the context of historical reality Mm -hmm. and i assume you were just being ironic right (laughs) because no uh, no no i mean i i meant uh, i meant the the reality of the the fighting in the movie how um you know how how sort of incredibly violent it appeared and, and i mean i can only imagine that it was even worse than that but as, as far as the actual history of the story of braveheart i don't actually you know I don't, I don't really know it so i mean i guess it's all it's all wrong I assume. yeah no it's actually i i looked it up and you know it's listed as the second most uh, the, the times of london had a list of most inaccurate historical movies and they have braveheart second on their list hmm. uh, actually out of the out of their top six three of them are mel gibson movies <laughs> Um, so does he just insist on that is that like part of his contract (laughs) it's like we must be as historically inaccurate as possible you know braveheart it's famous for depicting this the battle of sterling bridge with no bridge Um, (laughs) and you know his love interest would have been like two years old at the time Mm. he uh he wears a kilt in the movie and the kilt hadn't been invented yet and and stuff Mm. like that but uh, i came across this funny quote where uh a guy named John O'Farrell, who wrote An Utterly Impartial History of Britain, says that Braveheart could not have been more historically inaccurate even if a, quote, plasticine dog had been inserted in the film and the title changed to William Wallace and Gromit. <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a real shame, you know, because, I mean, the, it really seems authentic. Like, if you, don't know any, if you don't know about the history of the period, it, it comes off as pretty authentic. So that's actually kind of impressive in a, in a different way that, that they're able to sort of completely mangle the history and still make it seem like, Oh yeah, yeah I, I can believe that. Yeah. No, no, that seems right. But I mean, so many people don't know any history. This is sort of one of the things that really irritates me is that people are always just complaining about historical movies and they'll say, Oh, it was so historically inaccurate. And then when you actually listen to what their complaints are, half the time their complaints are wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Like the movie was actually right and mm-hmm. they're wrong, but they're complaining about it. You know, like, um, I was just looking at the Amazon.com page for, uh, you know, George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones, and there's just so many reviews that say, th- say things like, you know, a 15-year-old leading an army is pushing it a little, even for a fantasy novel, you know, and you're just kind of like, read, a his- read one history book in your <laughs> life, you know? I mean, that happens all the time in his- throughout history. I don't know, but, but kind of a funny example of this, you know, is, is when I was at USC, um, David Franzoni, who wrote Gladiator, came to, to talk to our class. And um, one of the things that he wanted to put in the movie that I thought was really, really cool was um, all throughout the movie, uh, the Emperor Commodus was going to be having a giant statue to himself erected. And then, you know, toward the end of the movie, the statue was going to be done and he was going to go to admire it. And there was going to be this gigantic poster of the hero Maximus behind the statue of Maximus, you know, sort of doing a product endorsement for olive oil. And this poster of Maximus was going to be three times the size of this big statue. And this was going to be what made Commodus just finally completely snap and lose it. And so, so this was in the script and the studio said, no, nah, take it out. Nobody's going to believe that gladiators do product endorsements. And, and the writer was like, well, wait, but that's, that's a real thing. I mean, they did that all the time. It was a complete part of that, you know, world. And they're like, no, nah, it just, you know, nobody's going to believe it. It just sounds made up. Well, I agree. It does sound made up, but. There surely is a, a way you could probably have done it that it would have uh, you could have sold it. I mean, if you can sell a, a movie full of historical inaccuracies, you know. I mean, that was another thing in, in Gladiator that all the statues and things are all white marble, and you know we think of Rome as being full of white marble because these days all the paint is washed off everything. But at the time, all those statues were all just painted with the most garish colors, mm. and that's another kind of thing. Like if they had had all these painted statues everywhere, I'm sure half the audience would have been like, "What the hell? That's not right." Mm-hmm. You know, even if it is. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, it's kind of funny too. Like, you know, I know one of the one of the complaints I always hear about um, historical movies is like, oh yeah, like so everybody in the Middle Ages had perfect teeth, huh? And I'm like, really? I mean, that's like what you're going to complain about? I mean, it's like, so so you want the costume designers to just like spend all this time like making these horrible looking rotting teeth <laughs> and put those in the, in the actors' mouths to to make it seem more authentic? I mean, you know, come on. But like uh, like in 300 too, the the way they depicted Spartan society. You know, was was it was kind of interesting, but I, I went and you know sort of did some research on this afterward because I was curious, and I came across there's a lecture by Donald Kagan, who's a professor at Yale. At Yale, they have certain classes that you can just watch them all for free online, and so I really recommend people watch his lecture on Sparta. It's it's really fascinating, and I just want to read. This is like part of my blog post that I wrote after after watching this. this so this is just you know some of the stuff that's in this lecture. Sparta maintained a massive slave population to do the farming, leaving the citizens free to spend all their time training for war. Spartan authorities examined every newborn and put to death any who showed signs of congenital weakness. That was actually in the movie. At age seven, Spartan boys were taken from their families and enrolled in military school, where they would remain until the age of 30. Students were not given enough to eat and were expected to supplement their diets by thieving, in the process learning initiative, guile, and self-reliance. Students trained nude within sight of the Spartan girls, who also participated in, in athletics and who also trained nude. Teenage males were expected to take a male lover from among their instructors, aged 20 to 30, and these pairs would remain good friends throughout their lives. At the age of 20, Spartan males were permitted to marry, but were not allowed to leave the school to visit their wives. They were expected to do so secretly, as with stealing food, and the penalties for getting, for getting caught were severe. For the wedding, the bride's head would be shaved, and she would be dressed up like a man. At the age of 30, men could leave the school and move in with their wives, but they still ate dinner every night in a cafeteria with their squad mates. And none of that was in the movie. <laughs> uh, and that would be, that would be real. I mean, I would just love to go see a movie where stuff like that was in it. You know, and I would just just like watch the audience's heads explode. You <laughs> know, yeah. I mean, I mean, with, with the three hundred, I can't really blame the movie for what's in it and what's not, just because I mean, it's based on that graphic novel. So you know, they're just sort of they're adapting that graphic novel. They weren't uh, trying to make an accurate, you know, any sort of accurate period picture, you know, based on that time time period. But um, you yeah, know, that would definitely be cool to see something like that. I mean, um, it's kind of surprising that no one has made something given that the three hundred was so popular. Just sort of as a counterpoint to to the movie, uh, to, you know, if you if you like Three Hundred, or if you hated the Three Hundred because of all of its uh, inaccuracies, you know, maybe you would like this other movie. Yeah, but I mean, can you? I, I can't really imagine Hollywood making a movie with that kind of stuff in it. I mean, mm -hmm. you just think about like how much people freaked out about Oliver Stone's Alexander, suggest you know the, the the just just a really mild material suggesting that Alexander was gay. Right. Um, did you see the Oliver Stone Alexander movie? No. Uh. <laughs> You know, I, I swear I fell asleep for like an hour and a half in the middle of that movie, and it still seems like it was about four hours too long. <laughs> it's it's it just seems like it just seems so long. I've actually heard that when they show it, you know, there's a part of the movie where Alexander is fighting a battle in India, and there's a, a part where it looks like he's done for. And I've heard that when they show the movie in India, they just end the movie there. Hmm. Yeah, and they're like, and then the Indians defeated Alexander the Great, <laughs> and everyone lived happily ever after. You know. The end. <laughs> Which, you know, is maybe not historically accurate, but I, I can't really complain about anything that makes that movie shorter. <laughs> uh, well, I, I was going to bring up a, a, a movie that's actually full of historical inaccuracies, but they don't bother me. Um, like, did you see A Knight's Tale? With Heath yeah, Ledger. actually, I actually really like that. Yeah, no, I mean, that's actually really, I mean, it's a really good fun movie, I think. I mean, obviously, if you're thinking that it's a, an accurate historical piece, then, you know, you're not going to enjoy it at all. But, um, you know, FNSF reviewed it when it came out. And I and I, rem I always remember the, the title of the review was um, like embracing the anachronism. And I mean, that's really how you have to approach that particular movie is that, you know, you have to go into it knowing that, you know, it's going to be anachronistic and, and, and they're having fun with that. <laughs> And, uh, and I mean, I think I just thought it was a, it, it did a pretty good job of making it seem like a really fun, exciting time. And, you know, I mean, maybe it wasn't that fun or exciting, but, uh, I mean, you know, there's knights and jousts and I mean, that it was all really cool. It was a, it was a pretty slick, uh, fun movie to watch. Just like when the, when the audience is like stomping on the bleachers and, you know, singing, we will rock you that just like for days afterward, I was thinking about that and chuckling. But I actually really like actually anachronistic kind of stuff like that. I mean, if it's done well and done intentionally, because it, it kind of has sort of the, some of the same pleasures for me as just like fantasy. You know, like I really like um, the Baz Luhrmann, Romeo and Juliet, where you have all the characters, you know, speaking the sort of Shakespearean Elizabethan 
iambic pentameter and all their values are kind of the, the values of that period. But then they also have helicopters and machine guns and cars and, you know, modern clothing and stuff. I, I just think it's really cool when people just slam stuff like that together. Yeah, I agree with you in theory, but I, I hate that movie, but um, we don't have to talk about that. <laughs> well, you know, you were asking Dan about um, Harry Turtle. You're, we were talking mm-hmm. with, with Dan about Harry Turtledove. And, uh, and and Harry Turtledove has, you know, sort of his first sort of best known novel is, is this book called The Guns of the South, in which uh, the Confederacy, you know, during the American Civil War, the Confederacy is supplied with automatic weapons to, to give, you know, by time travelers to give them an advantage. And so actually, I've, I've heard him talk about where he got the idea for that story. And it's, it's kind of cool. Um, I guess one of his author friends had a novel published and the, uh, you know, it was a sort of in a historical setting and the publisher put a cover on it where the um the hero was holding just a completely anachronistic kind of sword <laughs> I, I don't remember the details but the sword was you know from 500 years later in history or something like that and the uh the author complained to Her- to harry turtle dove saying you know this is like if they had put robert e lee <laughs> with an ak-47 on the cover of the book mm-hmm. and he was like hmm <laughs> robert e lee with an ak-47 but yeah, so I guess he was he was, ta- he was talking about some of the you know, like he did all this research, um, and it was actually he he really wanted uh, to pick a real historical unit to be the stars and to have like the names of all the mm-hmm. people in in the unit um, that he could use, and and it was actually he had to go through a lot of trouble to to dig up that information, and so he finally you know he went he got access to some ar- library archives and came home with you know all this information and, and all these lists of names, and his wife was looking through it, and he says you know she she came in after looking through this with a big smile on her face and you know he's kind of like what and she says you know there was a woman soldier in that unit and he just thought that that that, that was great that that was a great thing to to be able to use in the book but he says you know i would never have had the confidence to do that Mm -hmm. if i hadn't known that it was actually true you know that there actually was a, a, a female soldier in this unit right right you know you know it's interesting i mean i always love that concept for, uh, for that book uh and and it's a it's one of these things that, like, you know, you sort of can tell somebody what the gist of it is in, like, you know, one line, and, and so that's great, and uh, and it's, so it's, like, this big high-concept story. Also, it's, like, it's great for alternate history because it's, like, well, obviously, you know which parts are alternate in that story because of, of, of the guns and whatnot, but, I mean, one of the problems I have with a lot of alternate history is because I don't know um, all these different periods of history all that well, um, sometimes the alternate history element is so so sort of specific – or um, it's it's like it revolves around some minor point that I wasn't familiar with before that I really can't appreciate it, uh, you know, properly. Um, I almost kind of wish that there was a I could read alternate history with footnotes or, you know, if there was a sort of um, a little intro by the author before the story that could tell me, you know, what I needed to know about the actual historical period that the story or book is going to reference so that I could properly appreciate um, all the changes he's making. Years ago, I was at a writing workshop, and there was this guy, and he had written this story, and it was an alternate history. But, but like you were saying, the the point of departure was so subtle that nobody in the class, <laughs> you know, everyone was like, "I don't know, is this speculative fiction or not?" I mean, I, I couldn't tell. It just seems like historical fiction to me. Uh, so then we had we had arranged as part of the workshop, we had arranged a, a kind of you know sort of online chat with uh, Stan Schmidt, the editor of um, Analog Magazine. And so this this student asked asked Stan Schmidt, "What's the biggest problem you have with alternate history stories that are submitted to you?" And, and Stan Schmidt writes back, and he says, "Oh, by far, by far, the biggest problem we have with alternate history stories is that the point of departure is too subtle." <laughs> <laughs> and this guy was like, "Crap, you know." Well, you know, I did I did want to talk about some other history podcasts. Um, Go for it. So, I mean, you know, the Hardcore History is, is my favorite, but there are some other really good history podcasts that I listen to. Um, and one is called The History of Rome. And uh, actually, the most recent episodes, you know, it, it tends to focus on, you know, kind of politics and war and, and stuff like that. But the, the last few episodes have just been kind of an overview of Roman society uh, around the second century. And so if you want to get a feel for what the podcast is like, that would be those would be some great ones to listen to. Uh, do they ever mention uh, the HBO series Rome? Like, did they talk about like if that's historically accurate at all? Or I mean, because that that was a great show. But I mean, I, I obviously I don't. I, I mean, I only sort of have a a very layman's knowledge of you know the Roman times, so I don't know how accurate it is. He hasn't actually mentioned mentioned that on the podcast. I mean, that is a fantastic show. I mean, aside from all their British accents, obviously, uh, you know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, people always sort of complain about accents 
in historical things mm-hmm. that that's just one of those things that doesn't bother me i mean it's just something to me that you have to just give a pass on sort of like like it's it's funny what people will complain about like stuff like that or stuff like the tomatoes or mm-hmm. you know <laughs> Like in that movie Cloverfield, so many people were complaining about, oh, like how could a camera battery last for that long? <laughs> you know, yeah. th- things like that. And I've always, it's always seemed strange to me that people don't complain about stuff like, why does every person in this story look exactly like a famous actor? <laughs> right? Isn't that a bigger <laughs> sort of problem? But you know, you just right. go, you just go with it, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I agree with you. I always, uh, I always give people a pass generally on the accents, especially like if it's if it's an American trying to do an in- an English accent because of the role or whatever. Like, I'm pretty forgiving of that. But I mean, like that, like that show Rome. I mean, from what I understand, that they, they did a lot of really good stuff in that. Like, like they they did have Rome all painted. You know, like I was saying, um, mm-hmm. all, you know, like the statues painted and the walls all painted and things. And they showed Rome as kind of a ethnically diverse cosmopolitan center. You know, which it was. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I mean, just from reading, I've read some kind of commentary on the show and what they changed and things. And I mean, the big problem, it seems to me, when you're doing, when you're trying to do history as drama, is that so often the key events happened, you know, there were like two two years or five years between each key event. Mm -hmm. And so if you actually try to accurately convey the time frame, it just completely saps all the drama out of it because between every scene you would have, you know, two years later... (laughs) Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, in his poetics, Aristotle urges dramatists to observe certain unities. And, and one of them is time that you shouldn't have the story take place over a longer time frame than necessary. Mm-hmm. And so in pretty much all historical dramas, it seems like they take events that happened over 40 years and make it seem like it happened over a week, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so that's something I think that Rome does. And I don't know if there's really any good solution to that problem. We need to go back in time and make history happen in a more interesting, <laughs> timely fashion. But but in this History of Rome podcast, one of the, the things I thought was really fascinating that he was just talking about is is he was saying that there was essentially no no nightlife in Rome because the Romans, the ancient Romans never established any system of streetlights. And so after dark, it was just pitch black and, and Rome was just a maze. And if you weren't home by, by nightfall, you might spend all night wandering lost around the city. And that's when all the criminals would come out and and also, apparently, Julius Caesar had decreed that all deliveries had to be made after dark. And so, you know, you could easily just get run over by all these, you know, delivery carts that were just going through these pitch black streets. Something like that, I mean, is, is, is cool. It's is something that seems like science fiction, you know, that this com- right. completely alien environment. Yeah, speaking of Caesar, um, did you did, had you heard that like he was like captured by pirates at some point? Yeah. No. Yeah, you know, I mean, um, I always I thought that was like really cool. Like I learned that one because you know I was I, I edited this um, this uh, issue of Shimmer magazine that was a, a pirate issue, and, and so like I learned all this uh, different pirate lore. I, I mean, I, I was sort of already a fan of pirate lore anyway, and so that's like that's sort of one of my interests, um, like in historical fiction, is, is, is pirate stuff. So you know, Sid Meier's Pirates. I mean, like I, I played that like you know that was like my favorite game for for a long time, and so like a sort of formed a lot of my basis uh for being interested in pirates and so um i don't know if if you've seen this book that came out recently called empire of blue water Mm -hmm. um so it's this it's this uh history of 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 like the golden age of piracy um so it sort of focuses around sir francis drake who is uh sort of this famous british pirate of of that era and it had some really just really really cool stuff in there that um like like the idea of fire ships where they would have like these derelict ships that would just sort of float around with their fleet and they would use um, to sort of lure other ships over to them. And then they wouldn't, the, um, they would sort of like fire, um, fire arrows at them to, uh, to make them like sort of set on fire and then explode uh, with the fire ships. They actually made like wood cutouts of people <laughs> to put on the ship to make it seem like the ship had people on it. And uh, I just thought that was really like weird and clever that, and, and it was weird that it worked like, you know, cause you would think that it, that that would be, you know, transparent, but I mean, I guess, you know, the distances involved, like, you know, even with their spy glasses, I guess they couldn't tell that, uh, that the ship was actually, you know, not crewed, but I mean, that well, was, you know, a, these are guys who saw mermaids everywhere they looked. So. <laughs> yeah. No, but that, 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 that was just a really, uh, really great book. Uh, I mean, if you're interested in pirates, but no, the, you know, the story about Caesar is a famous, really cool story where he, he had been captured by pirates and they, you know, since he was from a wealthy family, they wanted to ransom him off. And he ended up spending quite a, a long time, you know, before his family got the ransom together. And he mm-hmm. kind of made friends with all the pirates. And they really liked him because he was very charismatic and politically mm-hmm. astute and stuff. And he always said, you know, as soon as I get free, I'm going to come back and kill all of you. And they'd all kind of joke at him because he was just, he was like a, he was fairly young at the time. 
And, you know, as soon as he got ransomed, he came back and, you know, even though he had become good friends with all these guys, he killed them all because because he was effing Julius Caesar, man. <laughs> well, at least he kept his promises. <laughs> yeah. And then sort of another uh, another really good history podcast I wanted to mention is called 12 Byzantine Rulers. This mm. is actually when, when we interviewed Steve Ely back in episode seven. He, he mentioned this as one of his favorite podcasts, too. And most people don't know what the Byzantine Empire was at all. And it's kind of funny because it was such a big part of history. And there's kind of a funny story, according to the according to this podcast anyway, there's, there's kind of a funny story for why the Byzantine Empire is so relatively unknown, is that there was a really influential historian named Edward Gibbon who wrote uh, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And when he was a kid, he tried to convert from Protestantism to Catholicism, and his family really came down on him hard, and this just kind of left him with a distaste for Christianity in general. And so when he wrote his history of the Roman Empire, he just wasn't interested in it after it became Christian, which is, you know, what the Byzantine uh, part of it is. And so when he, he was so influential that essentially everyone ignored the Byzantine Empire, just followed his lead. And so it's just this big hole in history that, you know, there's like 10 centuries of the Roman Empire that are just missing from most people's consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I don't know anything about it, really. Maybe I should listen to that podcast. <laughs> Um, and actually the guy who did that, I mean, and it's a kind of, um, you know, it's done. So you can start at the beginning and listen to the end and, you know, listen mm -hmm. to the whole thing. And you don't have to wait for any new episodes to come out. But since it was so popular, the guy who did that, he actually just started a, a new one uh, called Norman Centuries. And mm -hmm. it's only up to about episode five right now. But it's, you know, it's really good so far, too, you know, about the, the Normans. Oh, I was going to say, uh, you know, when you were talking about um, those different podcasts and then after having spoken with Dan, um, I'm really starting to get behind your idea of um, educating yourself through listening to awesome podcasts rather than uh, than relying on the school system or whatever. Um, like, for instance, I mean, I could totally see like having uh, like wanting to become a historian or something after, you know, listening to somebody like Dan, you know, and I mean, I haven't checked out those other ones you talked about. But um, I mean, if they're as good as hardcore history, then, you know. It seems like that's the kind of thing that you really need to get in the hands of or, you know, get in front of kids to get them excited about these different subjects. Um, you know, because I think there's so many things in uh, in school, not just history, that uh, like we all find interesting when we're older. But then, like, you know, we just sort of paid no attention to when we were younger. And by the time we're older, it's like it's too late for us to sort of pursue a career in these things. You know, I mean, uh, I wonder if, uh, you know, we're going to sort of have fewer and fewer people pursuing something like, you know, history you know, if uh, the school system keeps making it seem so boring. Yeah, well, actually, I mean, I have I have a lot of issues with the way that history is taught in, in school. And you know, I was thinking about this because, I mean, when I was a kid, I was taught in school that in Christopher Columbus's day, everyone believed that the world was flat mm -hmm. and he thought that they were wrong. And so he set out to prove that the world was round by sailing west. Right. And, you know, his crew all thought that there were going to be sea monsters and stuff, and he had to constantly fight with them. And then they discovered the new world, you know, and, and none of this is even close to true. <laughs> well, I mean, he did discover the <laughs> North America, right. but none of the rest of that stuff is, is true at all. And I'm like, why are they teaching stuff in school that is so wildly inaccurate? I, I can see how those sort of things crept into our history books if, like, they're trying to make it seem interesting and the actual historical events were not. But, I mean, that's really... <laughs> That's not the best way to get people interested in a topic by, you know, like if later on they learn, oh, that's what, that was just all complete BS. Yeah, no, I mean, that was certainly my experience as a student is it seemed like every year in elementary school, you would go into history class and they're like, okay, you know, all that stuff we taught you last year, it's all mm -hmm. BS, <laughs> you know, but every year it was like that. And yeah, and it does really, I think, affect your outlook toward education. But, you know, like there was this book I read, I don't know, kind of was when I was a teenager called Lies My Teacher Told Me. Mm -hmm. where uh you know he sort of he, he kind of does a survey of the 12 leading primary school history textbooks and says you know he's like i'm the only person who's ever read all 12 and and survived <laughs> you know because he's because they're so boring that yeah and he says you know it's not even like it's, it's not like they can't even see the forest for the trees he's like they can't even see the trees for the leaves it's just mm -hmm. this avalanche of minutiae and dates and names and and things that that you're not ever going to remember and that don't actually give you any kind of sort of overall understanding of what actually happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, it, it seems like maybe, uh, you know, for what schools should do is just throw out, throw out the textbooks and replace them with, uh, you know, podcasts like Hardcore History. And Geek's Guide to and the Geek's Galaxy. Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> and that was our show. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. <laughs> 
If you'd like to share your thoughts about any of the topics we discussed today, we'd love to hear from you. Just go to Tor.com and click on Podcasts, and then Geek's Guide to the Galaxy Episode 15 and post a comment there. And be sure to join us next week when we'll interview Jonathan Colton, a musician famous for his songs containing themes of geek culture, as well as for his rise to popularity through the use of the internet. See you then. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Tor.com. For this episode's show notes, or to subscribe to this podcast, visit Tor.com and click on Podcasts. For more information about your hosts, visit johnjosephadams.com or davidbarrcurrently.com. Music and voiceover produced by Deadspill 9 Entertainment. If you've enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.